I am a piano teacher of over 25 years. Um, I wanted to bring you something a little bit different today in this video. Um, normally it's tips and tricks on learning to play the piano or music generally, but today um, I wanted to introduce you to the music binder um, from my other business, Learning That Sticks. Um, Learning That Sticks creates educational resources for young children, but we try to kind of put a nice fun spin on it with Velcro sticking and early writing skills and things. So this will be incorporated into this music binder. The binder is um, personalized with the name of the person who'll be using it. So the first page is number the fingers. Um, this is something that we do in piano lessons right at the very beginning with learning. Um, it's really important that the student understands the finger numbers for the fingers that they're going to see in both scales and pieces as they develop. So this is just a really fun way of sticking the finger numbers on and getting used to the fact that the thumb is one in both hands and that actually is one thing that a lot of people really struggle with. They can be absolutely fine with one, two, three, four, five on the right hand but then tend to do one with a little finger on the left. So this is a really good way of reinforcing that. And again, with this, you can do things out of order. So you could say, um, find me the second finger on both hands, and then the student would have to put the two on for each hand. When a student first learns to play the piano, ordinarily they're in what we call a five finger position. So for your right hand, this might be C to G. And for the left hand, there are a couple of different ways. That would either be C, to F where both thumbs share middle C or some books will use the low C to G. Um, this will really help again with the five finger position because what they're not then worrying about is having to write in all the finger numbers which can then lead them to not read the music. So knowing your finger numbers might seem like such a simple thing to do but it's actually one of the most important skills that they learn before they even really embark on playing any pieces. So the second page is placing on what I call the twins and the triplets. Um, for this, all they'd have to do is find the twins and stick them on in the correct place. And then they would map this all the way along the keyboard on the page. Um, for this, we're starting to look at the piano in a slightly different way and we're mapping the piano out in using the black keys, but actually being able to divide the piano up into repeated sections over and over stops the piano being quite so daunting as it can be when you see a full size keyboard. By being able to map out your piano, you're then using that as a precursor to learning the names of the notes on the keys. The third page is place the letters in the order on the keyboard. So for this, the student would have them all listed down the bottom and they would just have to put the ABC. For this, they would realize then that they can use the mapping that they've just learned with the black keys to find A um, and then place all the letters from the musical alphabet, which goes from A to G and then back to A again. By having both A's in place, it just means that all they really have to know is their alphabet between A and G and they'll be absolutely fine. This is another way of cutting down how big that keyboard can really seem at the beginning. Um, one really good tip for this is actually to get them, once they've done the musical alphabet, so from A to G, to actually get them to do things out of sequence. So to put in, first of all, C. C lives underneath the first twin and the next one to find would be F who lives under the first triplet. Those two are actually really good reference points when you're learning, so that what it does is it stops the student from just doing their alphabet and not really looking at the notes to see where they're positioned. By finding two that are out of sequence, they can then perhaps start to find, say, B, who lives underneath C, and D, who lives above him. So you can actually get the other notes just based off of what you've already done so far with the twins and the triplets and finding C and F. This page is about recognising and drawing the treble and bass clefs. So the stages that you've been through so far is you've mapped the piano out into twins and triplets all the way from the bottom of the keys to the top. You're then starting to look at what we'd call an octave, so an A to A, B to B, um, and you're starting to learn the names of your notes and where they're located. 
Now what we have to do is to split the piano itself into half. So we have the higher notes which are taken by the treble clef and the lower notes which are taken by the bass clef. And we tend to do this from middle C upwards at the beginning for treble and middle C downwards for bass. One way of really getting subjects um, into the head of particularly young children is to get them to draw or to write but that with these symbols can be very difficult so we've made this into a dot to dot so again kind of helps with reinforcing numbers but really it's so much more fun and it's really good to get to the end of it and see that you've drawn a really perfect treble clef I wish I'd had this when I was younger the bass clef is much easier but the treble clef you have to really take your time so with this page you're looking to reinforce what the treble clef and the bass clef both look like and also what they mean for your music. Now that we know what the treble and bass clefs are and what they mean for us, we start to look at the names of some of the notes that you'll see on the page. For this, the best way to do it, again, is we, you'll find this as we go through, you tend to split things up into music to make it that little bit easier to digest. So for the treble clef, we're starting to look at the lines family. So we have a rhyme that goes for the lines family, which is every, green, bus, drives, fast. This helps to associate a word with its location on the music and you can then later on transfer that onto the piano which I will show you as well but for the beginning bit just saying to your your young child oh what's the rhyme for the line so they'd say every green bus drives fast then they can use it to pinpoint random ones so after they're used to just putting the rhyme into the correct order you could say well what's that one and they'd have to go oh it's a uh, green g the space family we have f a, C, E, bass. The same principle applies in the space family, the notes located in the spaces in between those lines. And again, you can do the same thing where you get them to spell the word out first, but then also to pop them in in different orders. That's a way of really finding out which notes they do and don't know. Um, I'm going to insert a clip here so that you can see where those notes are then located on the piano as well. Um, one little funny thing to remember is that with family, so a line to a line or a space to a space, as much as we love family, there's usually someone needing to stand between us to keep us apart. And that's gonna be the same with your notes. E to G has a note in the middle. So when you're looking to maybe transfer some of these skills onto a keyboard or onto a piano, just remember that a line to a line has a note standing in the middle and so does a space to a space. Every green bus drives fast. So for the lines we need to find middle C in the middle of the piano. E is hit. Every green bus drives fast. Notice the family. A line to a line has someone standing in the middle. Every green bus drives fast. For the space family, F, A, C, E. And for this we go one up from E to find F and we jump. F, A, C, E. And to do this out of sequence, we could say find, where does drives go? Drives, every green bus drives. Having looked at the treble clef, we now move on to the bass clef. So this would be for the notes from around middle C, so the middle of the piano, down to the bottom. Again, we split the notes up on the page into the lines and the spaces families. Now the lines, we have grizzly, bears, don't, beer, anything, probably fairly true. And for the spaces, this is my favourite one, all cows. 
eat when I ask this question what do cows eat nine times out of ten I get milk grass yes they do all cows eat grass if you remember animals in the left that's a really good way to try and differentiate the treble clef from the bass clef but again same principle applies what you can do is get them to pop these on in order first and when they start to get really good at this you then want to start them putting them on in random orders so where would we put for example bears b bear so that letter there is b now for this we find middle c and we jump past the next C and down to this G down here. So this really is quite a grizzly kind of sound. We have grizzly, bears, don't, fear, anything. G, B, D, F, A. Remembering that family have a note standing between them. So we jump between these lined notes. Now for the space family, we have all cows eat grass. We find our grizzly and we go one up from there to A and we jump. All cows eat grass. A, C, E, G. Now before we really embark on this page, I'm going to insert a clip of some of the lengths of notes that you need. Half of your battle is actually putting rhythm into the pieces that you play. If I played you Happy Birthday and put no rhythm into it and just notes, the chances are you probably wouldn't understand what I was playing. Rhythm is just as important as the notes that you're playing. For this, we have to learn when we look at a note on the page, how long we're supposed to hold that note down for. For this, I'll insert a clip that gives you the answers to this. So this will take you from a quarter of a beat, which is called a semiquaver, all the way through to the longest one that we're going to deal with at this stage, which is called a semi-brief. Um, once you've learned these notes there, then you can start to embark on this page. So we're going to be learning about the semiquaver, the quaver, crotchet, minim, dotted minim, and semi-brief. For this, I like to use a bit of a story to do with the life cycle of a note. Now the first one we're going to be dealing with is a crotchet. Now I realise that in the binder we actually have a couple of notes that are smaller than a crotchet. I kind of believe to be honest that this is the best place to start with the life cycle and we will backtrack in our story um, and have kind of a prequel to it. So we have our crotchet he at the moment is the youngest note that we have and he is only worth one beat. That would sound something like one, 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 one. As our note gets a bit older, he loses his colour and he becomes a minim. He is now worth two beats. So for this, he would sound like one, two. One, two. As he grows older and gets a little bit more independent, he gets a friend. Bit of a rubbish friend, it's just a dot. So he is now called a dotted minim inventive, and he is now three beats. So we would do something like one, two, three. One, two, three. Now for the last one, he loses his stick altogether. He doesn't need it anymore. He is now fully independent and he is called the longest name we have here, a semi-brief. He is now four beats old. And for this, we would hold one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. When you're learning this, at the beginning stage, it is nice to have the names as well, but really all you're looking for is what the note looks like and how long you hold it for, so how many beats it's worth. Being able to do the names is something that I insist on, but I do know that not all people um, do insist on that, and also it just depends on the age of the person that's learning. So what it looks like, ideally what its name is, and how long we hold it for. And you can see the life cycle 
of our little note. Now the prequel to this is what happened to the crotchet before he became a crotchet. Well, before that, he was something called a quaver. And being just half a beat, he has a little tail to help him with his balance. Now, as with all little ones, they're a bit excitable, so this guy goes that little bit quicker. Before that even, he was a semi-quaver. He was just a quarter of a beat. He has two tails because he does need support and to be honest with you these ones here so the semi quaver and the quaver are often paired with other notes of a similar size to them um, and they tend to equal one beat together so they do can, tend to go around in a little bit of a group or a batch um, so it's it's probably at the early stages again it's something that you may not encounter too early most of the time early learners are dealing with this it's just that it's again it's a nice thing to be able to know for the future even if you aren't going to be playing either of these kinds of beats up here Knowing how to play these is crucial. Knowing how to play these is a nice to know. Now that you've conquered this side, this will enable you to go to the page and to be able to connect the dotted minim over to how many beats it's worth. If you're doing this with a child, um, you might be able to then extend this page. And if you find they can do this quite quickly, ask them for the name of the note before they connect it. So I might say to a student of mine, please, can you find the semi breathe in the middle line? So they would find the semi breathe and then connect it to how many beats it's worth. So now from the clip that you've just watched, you feel like you might know the names of the notes, what they look like and how long you hold them for, then we can start this one. Now I've done a couple already, but these are um, wipeable. So if you've got a dry wipe pen, you can wipe them off and do them again next time. Um, so for the quarter, so for the semi quaver, you would have a look at all of the watermelons to see which one might represent a quarter and then you would draw your line over to here. It's just another fun way of trying to reinforce the counting but without it being quite as mundane as it sometimes can be when you're learning to play an instrument. Now the last page deals with a topic called time signatures. So you've learned that a lot of the things that we do in music um, are split up into smaller bits. We've split the piano up into various different parts. We've done black notes, we've done octaves, we've done treble, we've done bass, we've even got rhymes going. So we've had loads of different things that we split up. When you move to the music that's on the page, this is no different. If you saw a sea of notes, I would put money on the fact that 20 seconds in, you'd have lost your place. If there was no way of tracking where you were. Counting does help with this, but actually what we do is we split the music up into something called bars. The way I like to describe this is a bit like classrooms. If you had a class of 30 children and you had another class of 30 or 40 children and you amalgamated them all together, it would be a nightmare to try and figure out who you had, what they were doing, what they were supposed to be working on. So what we do with children is we split them up into different classrooms with 30 in one, 30 in another. And even then you would split them onto tables, tables of five or six so that you can clearly see who you have, what they're doing and where you are. Music is no different. We have all of our music split up into bars and within those bars, we are only allowed the same number of beats. So for this, we know that a minim is worth two beats and each of these crotchets is worth one. So within that bar, we're looking at one, two, three, four beats. Now when it comes to the time signature, we're actually looking for the top number. So we have a choice of four, three, two, and another three. We counted four in that bar, so we're going to put four, four at the top. The next one on, again, this is another math thing. So we have one, two halves, so that makes one as well, and another one, another crotchet. So we have one, two, three. So we would choose one of our threes 